Good evening. I'm Selwyn Collins of CWS Conversations with Selwyn. Thank you for joining us. Those of you who are joining us for the first time, a very special thank you. CWS is about having conversations with people about their journeys and how they're using their gifts and talents to help others. So I'm always looking for people who are doing extraordinary things or doing things extraordinarily well. I believe that when we share our stories, we're never more connected as human beings. And I say this because I believe that when we speak about our successes, not just to glorify ourselves, but when we also speak about our challenges, we never know who might be listening and who might be inspired by how we overcame some of those challenges, how often we got up when we fell. And just imagine someone somewhere listening to you, perhaps a young person, being able to overcome their limitations and their challenges and one day becoming a head of state or someone who stops a genocide. We never know. But what is important is that we have the capacity to give without expectations, not to know what our gifts or the, the extent of our gifts or the results of our gifts, but just give because we must and we should. I also believe that when we are successful, our successes do not necessarily belong to us alone. It belongs to all of us because I see success as a beacon to illuminate others, to remind them that they too can shine. So CWS is about encouraging people to commit to their ideas and to pursue success. But as I said, not just to glorify themselves, but so that they can remind the rest of us that we too can if we try. Tonight my guest is Dr. Paloma Muhammad, one of the gems of our soil. Dr. Paloma Muhammad is Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of Guyana. She teaches advanced communications research, television production, behavioral health and social psychology. She has authored over nine books. The most recent is Communication, Power, and Change in the Caribbean. She was educated at the, Guyana, at the University of Guyana, Harvard University, and the University of the West Indies. She's an essayist and a prize-winning playwright and director. She has won the coveted Guyana Prize for Literature on two occasions. Paloma Mohammed has taught drama in Guyana and is one of the drafters of the current drama curriculum in that country. I'll take a short break and introduce you formally to Dr. Mohammed when I return. Good evening. I'm Selwyn Collins of CWS Conversations with Selwyn. Thank you for joining us. Those of you who are joining us for the first time, a very special thank you. CWS is about having conversations with people about their journeys and how they're using their gifts and talents to help others. So I'm always looking for people who are doing extraordinary things or doing things extraordinarily well. I believe that when we share our stories, we are never more connected as human beings. And I say this because I believe that when we speak about our successes, not just to glorify ourselves, but when we also speak about our challenges, we never know who might be listening and who might be inspired by how we overcame some of those challenges, how often we got up when we fell. And just imagine someone somewhere listening to you, perhaps a young person, being able to overcome their limitations and their challenges and one day becoming a head of state or someone who stops a genocide. We never know. But what is important is that we have the capacity to give without expectations, not to know what our gifts or the, the extent of our gifts or the results of our gifts, but just give because we must and we should. I also believe that when we are successful, our successes do not necessarily belong to us alone. It belongs to all of us because I see success as a beacon to illuminate others, to remind them that they too can shine. So CWS is about encouraging people to commit to their ideas and to pursue success. But as I said, not just to glorify themselves, 
but so that they can remind the rest of us that we too can if we try. Tonight my guest is Dr. Paloma Muhammad, one of the gems of our soil. Dr. Paloma Muhammad is Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of Guyana. She teaches advanced communications research, television production, behavioral health and social psychology. She has authored over nine books. The most recent is Communication, Power, and Change in the Caribbean. She was educated at the, Guyana, at the University of Guyana, Harvard University, and the University of the West Indies. She's an essayist and a prize-winning playwright and director. She has won the coveted Guyana Prize for Literature on two occasions. Paloma Mohammed has taught drama in Guyana and is one of the drafters of the current drama curriculum in that country. I'll take a short break and introduce you formally to Dr. Mohammed when I return. So we are back. Let's try this again. Dr. Mohamed, it is a pleasure to have you on CWS. Congratulations on your recent book, Communication, Power and Change in the Caribbean. Tell us what inspired this book and who did you write it for? Well, I wrote it. It was actually based on my PhD thesis and it's actually not my most recent book. It is the second. Second. Yeah. The Sorry. most recent one is Notes on the Media in Guyana. But this book in particular is about... Um, my own interest in how communications can be implicated in changing people's lives for the better and I wanted to be able to add to the published literature on the media in the Caribbean because there is not that much um, published from our perspective and so I uh, worked with Hansen really strong publishing house that publishes Caribbean work out of London and Arif Bulkan of course is Guyanese so Arif Ali sorry um, is Guyanese so um, that book came out about a year or so ago um, yeah so basically that's in a nutshell what it's about if, if you were not lecturing in a university writing books or directing plays what would you be doing as a professional <laughs> I wanted to be a quantum physicist. <laughs> yeah, that might shock a lot of people. Um, yeah, uh, but I didn't have the maths background, and and I didn't have the science background. Um, so I content myself with reading about these interesting matters. But I'm really interested about in in what informs life and what causes matter to take form and what causes. Um, things to appear in the real world you know as much as I am interested in the imagined world which is the world of the mind so yeah you were born in Georgetown Diana yeah. can you gl give us a glimpse of Paloma at the age of 9 15 and who she became at 21 we ah, long time ago but uh, 9 I was really 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 shy um, still very much so people will not believe this um, at my I think at my core I'm still that very shy introverted girl but I had to learn <laughs> to basically grow up and be outspoken and, and stand up for myself uh, but at nine I was my parents had just gotten divorced and I was really really taking handling that very very badly um, so that was not a very good period for me. That was probably one of the worst periods of my life when I was really just trying to deal with loss and you know everything that it meant. Because when, when my parents separated, my father came here to the States um, and my mom had four of us. I was the eldest and we, she had three, three brothers, my three brothers. And it really disrupted the family in a very, very, um, very terrible way and she herself as a young woman she was only 28 um, was trying to 
kind of keep her family together, keep her head above water. She had never worked in her life. And so this was a very difficult period. This was the period when she has told us that she contemplated putting us into an orphanage and actually took us one night to, um, to a particular orphanage. And the nuns told her, you know, you have to keep your children. God is going to show you a way. And I think that this, a lot of people don't know this, but this, I think, has informed a lot of my personal stance where it comes to fighting for other people and... Uh, how, how strongly I feel about uh, people's destinies and and the role of spirit in God in people's lives and the role of other people. Um, just think if that person had said to her, look, we'll take the children in, what my own life would have been. Um, so th that nine-year-old Paloma was a very fragile, vulnerable, extremely introverted, unhappy child. And... Um, but I think from that moment, I think my mother basically became woman at that point and really dedicated her life after that to raising the children. Um, and then she had a lot of help, a lot of help, as the nun had said, came from many, many places, um, especially with regard to me. Um, I had a lot of people raise me, their hand you know, was in my life, on my life in a very special, powerful way. So by the time I became 15, I, was, I had already begun to uh, become a kind of noticeable in Guyana in terms of the arts and in terms of academia as well, in a certain sense, um, because I had already represented Guyana many times overseas. I, was, I had already started to win um, contests, you know, singing contests, allocution contests, debating in high school. I was dancing, I was in drama, I was playing music, you know. Um, so by that time, I had kind of begun to have a sense of who I was. And then all of that kind of went totally overboard when I became 21. Because um, my mother had this very, I had this very strange life. Because I wasn't growing up with my mother from about 11. I was growing up with um, an aunt who was actually here in, in New, York, New York and just actually came from her house. Um, Dorothy Smart and her daughters, Jackie, Carolyn, and Sandra, and their father, Loris, who was living like a street away from my mother's house. So I had this kind of two sets of parents kind of thing going on. And of course, my mother still had a lot of control over what was happening morally and their, you know. And when I got to 21, this is now a kind of a crisis because you have this girl who could go and sing anywhere and Anytime anybody asked me to perform, my mother could say, yes, she can do this. But I couldn't go to parties. I couldn't do this. I couldn't do that. So I lived a very kind of interesting, a public life, but privately very sheltered life, if that is, makes any sense. Um, and of course, in my own head, I was trying to work out who I was, what I wanted to do, um, what was possible in the context of Guyana for me at the time. Um, so yeah, uh, that was very interesting. You know, I, I, I am drawn to what you said earlier about quantum physics and how you related it to yeah. when the nun spoke to your mom. Yeah. That intervention mm -hmm. and your, your fascination with how people come, come into our lives mm -hmm. for different reasons. When did you, I, 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 I kind of surmised that it was on reflection that you realized that, but when, wh what series of events took place? that get you to that space where you develop this fascination with people coming into your life and that no one who comes into your life is really for a waste of time. When did that happen, or how did that happen? Well, it's a strange set of things. Um, first of all, my teenage period was a very weird period for me. Spiritually, it was very, very weird. Um, I had a dream about what I now understand what I was going to do when I was about 14. I actually wrote it down in a, and it's published as a poem. But most people would probably wonder what the hell was she writing about. But it was actually this actual dream that I had and I kind of rewrote as a poem. It was called Nirvana in a Dream. And it's published in my first book called, Com the book is called Come Fire. And it's the first poem in that book. It's, it's, it's 21 stanzas or something like that. But it just basically it relates this dream. 
And this dream basically showed me exactly what I was going to do, but I didn't know that, right? So I was like, what the hell is this? This is kind of weird stuff, right? And then going on in tandem with what, what, what was I considered to be a kind of a spiritual awakening for me was uh, a lot of stuff that would happen because people would meet me in the streets and give me stuff right i have a ring that a woman met me just like that on the on, on on the street and gave to me a gold ring which i wore for many years and then i just put it away afterwards i said look this is kind of mad you can't just be wearing things people give you just like that people would meet me on the street and speak to me about strange stuff say stuff like you know there are angels everywhere it's, it, this actually happened i'm not mad but i never um actually tried to put it together make any sense of it at all um, what I what I was doing though was that I was seeking I was reading everything that you could think about in, in terms of uh, religious li literature any book from the book of Dan to Confucius to the the the, the, the um, uh, Quran to Bible to everything that I could put my hand on I was reading because I was trying to understand I think what was I guess my own meaning the meaning of my own existence where I came from what this question of God was and this also of course was re was kind of very much um, kind of linked to who my parents were because remember my mother is black from French Caribbean she's not Guyanese by birth uh, so she's French Creole and my father was Indian right and Muslim and my mother was Roman Catholic and I had this strange upbringing where I went to Roman Catholic church with my mother to the mosque with my father and I went to Hindu school Ramakrishna right around the corner and so in my growing up I had like all of these influences that were linked to God and religion and, and, and identity that I was I think trying to understand what, what what to make sense of this right so I started to read around this question and people would give me books I and, and, and send stuff for me and things like that and so I think then my godmother, who's Celeste Dolphin, who um, was fi from a famous family um, of musicians and cultural family, right? Um, she was the broadcaster. Lynette Dolphin was the, mu the, the director of culture. Um, and I kind of also grew up in their house in a sense. So I, like I said, I had a lot of people influencing my early life. I'm very thankful for that. And I think that a lot of that is coming out in what I do now. But she and Celeste and I, this was very weird because we never discussed my interest in quantum physics at all. She gave me this book that somebody gave her for Christmas. I think it was Malcolm Paris or somebody like that. I can't remember. I have to go back and look in, at the inscription. But I remember she gave me this book and said, look, read this book. And it was Carl Sagan's book, Contact, right? So now this began to, I'm doing all this this studying, uh, you know, informal reading about religion and God and where, how do, do these things work. And I am now given this book, which is the quantum physics introduction, a fictional uh, introduction to quantum physics. And then I start to read um, more about that. Um, so that's really how all of that kind of came together. It was in a weird set of circumstances. But again, it didn't make any sense to me. I didn't start, I didn't think about it, right? Um, until... I think I was in my 20s, really, when I really began to recognize that there is a link between, I at least I, for me, a very powerful link between what I think, what I say, and what I can make happen. Um, and that kind of scared me tremendously um, at first. And I would pray that I didn't have, I couldn't, that this was not a gift at all that I couldn't do these things and that I just was, you know. Um, and so I, I just forgot about that for a long time and just was plodding along, doing things, getting pulled in all kinds of directions and stuff. But then at some point you come back to your spirituality and I've come, to the, come back to that uh, through the Christian route because that's really where my strongest foundation is because of my mother and because of the friends that I have and, and I think. Um, so for me, there is God, and this is, to discuss that is gonna be a whole other show, right? But, but there is spirit and the disconnection that you have. And if you honestly believe in that, and that 
uh, and see how God works in your life because I see it. I see it absolutely. People may think I'm mad. That's okay. But I see that I pray and how, what God does. Right? And they may say, well, how you know it's God and not? I didn't pray to anybody else. I <laughs> pray, right? So, all right. Um, and, and so for that, for me, that kind of all coalesced into this concept that Paloma look number of things you could have been born anywhere else in the world why were you born in Guyana at this particular point in time to these particular parents because the circumstances of my own birth in terms of the interracial marriage at that time in the 1960s for Guyana for my parents to do that they had to be really special people to do that right um, and then what that meant the schism that came when my father left was about this was about racial pressure right um, from his own family because he had married this black woman and this and that and all of that. And my mother was, you know, like I said, red, but it, it's still black, right? So there is all of this set of circumstances that produced me. Uh, this person who kind of rejects all of that, right? For me, the humanity of a person is what is important. And therefore, when you add that to spirituality, and the connectedness of all things because if, once you're into quantum physics you understand that nothing dies they just change form and then that that form begins to operate in different spheres different planes and they begin to uh and, and therefore life is about is it's is every if everything is always here it's about what you perceive what you can connect to and so on right so um then that basically is just a kind of informs a kind of perspective and philosophy of I think generosity mm -hmm. right that you you don't have to compete with people for things that nobody can take anything that is yours really and when it moves from your hands it is when it's it you must know when it's time to move for things to move and that supporting other people and loving them and trying to give things and to be doing this for Guyana was what I was meant to do um, and that's what I really feel. And so when people say to me, well, what are you doing there? Why, why are you there? Um, why are you earning whatever you're earning at UG? Why are you this or that? I feel that when the time comes, just like how I came back after I was burnished wherever and came to serve, when the time comes to me to go, I'll know because that's what happens. You, the door opens, you walk out, and then it closes, and you know that, well, that's it, right? I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking that the next time you come back, mm -hmm. we must have a conversation entirely on this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. No, seriously. Yeah, so the whole... <laughs> because I am, I'm sitting here enthralled, yeah. not because I am surprised or shocked or anything, but because I, I can relate to what you're talking about. I know you about. can relate, yes. And um, I think that it will be a disservice if we don't share this yeah. with other people. Yeah. I, I, I well, really they may not want to hear. They may think this is real weird because I don't think a lot of people know that this. Is th they know the side of me at all because they see the other side, which is very public and very this and that. Uh, maybe people who are really close. I yeah, know. sure. <laughs> <laughs> and this side of me, yeah. though, but you yeah. know, yeah, yeah. when the time comes, as you said, yeah. there's nothing we can do about that. Um, wh what is the fondest memories or fondest memory of your parent as a child? Your parents. Huh. Um, my father was, uh, I was very close to my father, you know, um, at first in the early years, because when my, this is another very interesting thing about my own birth, which is also, I think, quite symbolic. When my mother was about eight and a half months pregnant with me, she caught a fire, right? She was cooking in the, in the, in the kitchen with, in a negligee and her the fire caught the negligee and she burned from her neck down um, and so when I was born and my father came in very concerned through water on her to stop the fire but she was unconscious when I was born and had remained in the hospital for many 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 months after I was born so my father kind of took me home from the hospital and they have a Pyrex dish that they showed me that he was I was so tiny right he used to bathe me in this Pyrex dish, he said, because I was so small, right? And for most of my, my life, I was tiny, right? Physically very small. I just put on weight after I had my son and it wouldn't come off. But I was skinny for a lot of my life. Um, but um, so I, I remember being really close to my father. Very, very close, close, close. So um, him 
sitting with me and reading, taking me out on his bike, um, things like that. My relationship with my mother um, did not develop well until I became a teenager. Um, I think <clears throat> very much because she wanted so much for me and I was always a free spirit, you know, and I was bonded with my father and they, were, they had their own issues, which she was absolutely right about, but I was my father's daughter, so I wasn't listening to her. But the point is, um, my memories about my mother ha are with her basically um, taking me to music, to dancing, to anything cultural she could possibly involve me in because she is very much that person. That cultural part of, 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 of her is really that, of me, is that person and my mother. So she would basically take me everywhere. I remember her taking me very early to dancing, very, very small, tiny, tiny, to the um, national park. You know, um, I re also remember hiding from masquerade bands. <laughs> the first time I heard a masquerade band was terrifying, saw one. I remember running behind her skirt, you know. Um, but a lot of my memories about my mother uh, were are difficult memories because of how hard she had to work to raise us and how many personal sacrifices she's had to make um, to ensure that her children were, you know, okay. So um, that there's always that kind of, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah, if you were to eavesdrop a conversation mm -hmm. with your family, let's take three of them, your mom, mm -hmm. your dad, and your son. Tell, <laughs> tell them a stranger about you. What oh, you, Lord. What do you think? <laughs> What do you think each of them would say? She talks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Who would be saying that? All of them. <laughs> All of them would be saying that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes. She talks a lot. Yeah. But they, my, I, I heard my son saying the other day, and I was really touched by this, telling somebody, you know, my mother's really the most kind, the kindest person in the world. And I thought, wow, yeah, that's cool. That's cool for him to say. Yeah. What was your favorite say that subject in high school? Literature, English literature, for sure. Were you fond of high school? Though? Oh yeah, I loved it. I had a wonderful time at high school. Oh, when when did you realize you wanted to teach, and, and who do you believe was responsible for that? I didn't want to teach. I never. Well, my mother was a teacher, by the way. Right, my mother was head mistress of of Stella Maris and several other good nursery schools for years. And when I saw what she had to go through, she always had people's children in her house, this, that. I was like, no, 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 I'm not teaching. So what was Didn't the trigger teach. that got you into teaching? What got me into teaching was this particular thing that UG, I had just graduated, just completed my PhD, and met somebody who had taught me when I was at UG at a conference, and he said to me, Dr. Michael Scott, um, he said to me, Paloma, uh, you know the Center for Communication Studies, where incidentally I had gotten a first degree from the center many years ago before that. He said the center has been closed because there is nobody to teach. And there are these 60 students who have been not able to graduate for two years because there's nobody there to teach them this particular course, which was a broadcast course and a research course, which is what I'm still teaching. So I said, okay, well, I can go down and teach them the course and let them graduate. That will take me three months, and then I'll go back to Trinidad or come back to the States, and that's it. Well, the story, the short version of that story is, eight years later, seven years later, I'm still at UG. I became director of the Center for Communication Studies. We got quite a bit of support from the university itself and USAID and UNESCO to rebuild the center. Um, so we revamped the curriculum, put, put um, new equipment in there, and basically retooled the whole program. And I became director of the center for about three or four years. We were able to attract some really good people in there. Um, and we uh, basically, I stayed in Guyana. <laughs> so I, I, I didn't, and then I discovered I discovered that I really, 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 really love teaching. That I, to me, the greatest joy that I have is to see one of my students, or some of my students, in fact, really grasp something and really grow. And uh, this is the wonderful thing you could see in university, um, because especially young students who come out of high school, they come out of high school at 17, UG takes them in, and because their parents want them to do something, 
and so they're not sure they're really not into the studying thing and they don't know what they want to be and they just want to get out of there and this and that <clears throat> and then all of a sudden somewhere in after two years or something somebody comes and says doc can i talk to you about my post-grad work or something and then it's like yes right or even those who don't go on to postgrad, but you see them thinking in a way, affecting life in a, in a way, a positive way. And to me, that is most wonderful and gratifying. Um, so it's always a process of growing um, your own growth, the student's growth, because they, they uh, introduced me to things that I would never come into contact with um, uh, on a normal basis like some of them would say doc you're embarrassing us you don't know who this artist is you don't know who this is you don't know who that because I'm you know that's not the world I live in anymore and I would say yeah but do you know what this is <laughs> so we have you know we have a synergy you tell me what the popular culture is and I tell you what's in the books right <laughs> so how long have you been teaching well, I have been teaching uh, for what seven. I got back to Guyana in, in two thousand and seven. Yeah, so it's seven years. Seven yeah. Years. And yeah. how have you grown as a teacher? Oh yeah. Um, I think. Um, I think. First of all, I've learned different methodologies, right? Um, so I now teach through all kinds of things. I teach through film. I teach through stories. I teach through incidents. I teach through all kinds of things. So that is like a very interactive way that I, I will teach. Um, I and I teach a lot of stuff. I also teach uh, playwriting at the National School um, and at the Theatre Guild. So apart from my formal teaching at the university. Um, but I also think that the understanding that you never know uh, enough and a student can always surprise you and that really the teaching is about them learning, right? It's not about you teaching, right? It's really about them learning. So whatever it is that has to be done within reason um, to facilitate that um, and to open those minds and those hearts and those ears and that curiosity. Because once you get bitten with the bug of curiosity, believe you me, um, it is an entryway and they never, they never turn back, right? They may not go on to formal higher education immediately, but they always have that you know, searching mind, that curiosity, that fearlessness, that confidence to question and to know that when somebody's that person who's standing there uh, basically guiding this learning, right? As against delivering it, guiding it, <clears throat> is somebody you can ask and say anything to, um, with respect, of course, and that, that there's going to be an answer. Are we going to look for that answer? So for me, that is this reciprocal kind of relationship with my students um, is what I find to be very, very rewarding. And also the facilitation of their lives, because a lot of what we don't have at the University of Guyana um, that other universities may have is the counseling, right? Guidance counseling for students, you know? Um, some of them have person, we have a, guy, a wonderful guidance con a, 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 a counselor, a psychologist on campus called Dan Barker. Who's, that's his job to counsel people about their personal issues and all of that. Um, but a lot of times they come to you first as the lecturer and then you have to say, well, look, this is not my job. I'm not trained to do this. Uh, go to them. But a lot of times they will come and sit and talk to you. But sometimes not, not about, their work, about their personal problems, but just about direction, right? Um, what it is that they want to do. What is in the field? Which schools? How do you get into grad school? What, what is the importance of doing well in your undergrad program? Because if you want to, do, if you want to go on to grad school and you want to grow, you have that GPA is of importance because you're not going to get into a proper school if you don't do well. In the, so it's not like your mother sending you to school and so you just do it and just pass as in high school. I want, right? to, I want to take a quick break. Yeah. But I want to ask, well, let me read this in the chat room. Mm -hmm. GY to NY said, it is so good to hear from Paloma. It's been years. She's mm. always been fascinating. Mm. And I want to um, close for the break uh, with this question in your timeline again. Yeah. So I can phrase this. What type of sounds, for example, music, um, vocal cadences, do you remember as a child? Um, and, and was there a particular that you couldn't get enough 
Food? Yes. Food. Oh, I didn't like food at all. You didn't like food. I didn't like food. I was. I'm not still into not into food. Chocolate maybe. <laughs> 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 but not into food. I I, I like cook up rice and curry oh and gosh, stuff. Please, but um, so pepper pot. But I not. I mean, I could pass food by any day. But I drank a lot of milk. Um, but um, sounds masquerade, mm -hmm. masquerade, absolutely masquerade. But um, there's uh, different types of drums. Uh, I and guitar. My father played guitar. Guitar. Um, yeah. Uh, but different. And I had a f my one of my godfathers, Joey Samaru, was very much into music and played guitar for me and was um. Uh, Rudolf Brandt who used to play music for me yeah guitar absolutely guitar there's always a guitar in my house up to now um, piano in Aunt, Aunt Lynette's house which is in my house now um, but yeah I, th I'm very much into sound and music very much anything um, I, yeah I'm really eclectic in many regards so I'm yeah. getting the sense that you could not have avoided music no. No matter how much you No, tried. no, absolutely not. I, uh, my mother was into music. My father was into music. My godparents were into music. And you, you cannot be in Guyana, right? You're going to religious school for heaven's sake. You're going to Ramakrishna, and you're saying prayers every morning in Hindi, right? And then you're getting all these chautals and bhajan and this and that, because every... Um, holiday and all and you're singing right in the, in the mosque you're singing at Christian school you're singing in your house my parents playing uh, radio music um, uh, piano lessons violin lessons at Queens uh, classical guitar lessons <laughs> you know now I I am a very much um, uh, yeah, you can't escape. I mean, I couldn't escape art as well because my father painted. That's how I got my name, Paloma, from Paloma Picasso, of course. So, um, so he painted. Um, so there was that. So I, I, I don't know. There was. I don't know that I could have escaped art. But here's the here's the paradox, right? My mother says to me, I wanted to when I was heading in the direction of. She says, get a proper profession. Right. And that's how I, I did not go into theater and so on, like, completely. You cannot make a living from the theater. You cannot make a living from arts. And everybody who was supporting and nurturing that agreed with her, right? So that's the kind of paradox that I try to, you know, uh, you know I, I try to undermine that now because, of course, in those days, there was not much that you could do. But now, you know, there's a growing understanding that you can change lives through culture and art is very much implicated in that, the arts and the cultural industries and all that kind of stuff. And so, um, yeah, so I'm working, that's my love that I do for free. Uh, and I do that, but I became, a, as you know, a psych social psychologist um, because of that particular thing. So there was, you could do the arts, you know, that is your, in your blood and in your veins and in your heart, but you better learn to do something that you could eat by and I have to tell you that I'm not sure that I'm eating by my profession at UG so <laughs> I'm not sure if I was successful in any way but oh, let's, let's who knows you know? let's take a break yeah <laughs> We are back with Dr. Paloma Muhammad. Paloma, if you had to curl up somewhere in Guyana, mm -hmm. to relax, with a book, your favorite drink, mm -hmm. listening to your favorite music, mm -hmm. where would this place be? Essequibo. What would you be reading? Ah, Lord. What would I be reading? Hmm. I don't know. I don't know who I'd be reading. And plenty of people. Um, probably Toni Morrison. Toni. And what would um, you be listening to? Uh, probably be listening to jazz. Very soft jazz. Yeah. I, Keith I want, Waits, maybe. Keith, I want to shift <laughs> into your, 
into your theater side, your storytelling side. Yeah. Here is an event at your home, mm -hmm. a family event, mm -hmm. and a group of young ladies are sitting around you. Which they want, they happens want, often. <laughs> okay, they want you to tell them about Caribbean mythology, especially oh. uh, specifically Guyana. And you are to tell them a story either about your grandmother, your mother, or one of your godmothers. What story comes to mind? Well, you're asking me about three things in one sentence. Now I'm going to, here's the teacher and me coming out, right? Mm -hmm. So w what do you want <laughs> me to answer first? <laughs> Caribbean mythology is my book. Is, is that what you're speaking about? Or are you talking about the mythology of the Caribbean? The mythology of the Caribbean. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what, okay. So, um... What would I tell? What what kind of folk story I would tell them essentially? Yes. Right? Um, I I know all kinds of things, man. Um, I I, I kind of like this, the 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 um, the, the Balgobin stories a lot. Hmm. My friend Patama Prasad has just published a really interesting book of Balgobin stories, and um, and my students did a CD um, a video of of, of, of the book kind of on the Bagman stories um, or Anansi stories which I also love 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 I love Anansi stories or um, or specific Guyanese um, stories you know um, O-like stories I mean all kinds of things I've done a lot of work on mythology in Guyana um, you could talk about the myths about money you know stories about attached to money and finding the coin in the road you know you know when you this parents tell you don't pick up that money somebody can do you with the money if you know when you see a coin in the road <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> kind of thing. Right. <laughs> you know it kind of is still full of a lot of uh, very interesting uh, beliefs about you know folk beliefs and so on so yeah I could talk about a lot of things uh, yeah who are, who are some of the people who have inspired or influenced you in the playwright um, yeah definitely um, Andre O'Brien would be the first name that would come to mind um, very very close and dear friend and one of the three people there were three people when I first started writing because remember I started writing really early like and in when I was 13 I had written my first play right um, and of course nobody's taking you on at that age so I'm going I go and I take the play to Ron Robinson Ian MacDonald all these big people and of course they're very polite <laughs> and you know, we will look at the people, we will respond, we will give you comments but they didn't bother with me because um, maybe the plays weren't good and all that. But the point is that I always remember with absolute love and, and, and total uh, gratitude that Andre Sabrian would sit down with his pencil, he had a particular way, he used to sharpen his pencil with a, sh with a scalpel. And so he had a fine, 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 fine point. And so he could write a lot in a small space <laughs> with this pencil. And he would write me copious notes on my plays. Um, Al Crichton, who remained a friend, and I'd like to clear up this, this misconception that has been floating around for years. We were never romantic friends. He has always been a very close friend and a mentor um, because this has been a very destructive, uh, rumor that has been floating around the place as if you cannot have a friend who is a man who is looking who you're close with um, without having that kind of relation and I've had many of those so he was one of the early people as well who would critique my work and still does and got a lot of cussing from me uh, because I didn't accept it <laughs> um, of course you're young and you, you think that you're hot and nobody should say anything to you but you learn that you really don't know crap <laughs> at that age and you're still learning um, so, um, E. Feeble Wilkinson, Leslie Feeble Wilkinson, who was a Trinidadian, who um, was at the CARICOM cultural desk, uh, came there in 1988 and for, became a really close friend of our family. So, um, during those, that period when I was writing, I had uh, those three people who took a lot of time with me to not only read my work but introduce me to other work um, because remember this is a point in time in Guyana when really we have a closed society uh, we don't have television um, yet um, the internet is not there um, and um, we have a particular coming out of a particular period uh, so you're not exposed to different types of plays the traveling you had to you know a lot of things were happening at the time um, 
you know you couldn't travel as easily and all of that so for a young person like me uh, it was really important to be able to have people who knew the wider world and to introduce me to reading they would bring me plays to read insist that I read plays anytime there was an opportunity to go and learn something a workshop anywhere you know so there was that and then there was of course the theater guild um, which I'm still very 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 much involved with um, because of that that importance that it played and then later on um, there were people like Raul Gibbons out of Trinidad um, Alvin Bully out of Trinidad uh, N2 Springer out of Trinidad uh, Ron uh, and Ian them you know later on as the work became important they would comment and so on so yeah and um, there are a number I'm probably forgetting people as well because there's so many people but those are the three the first three who would always have my homage because they spent the time and I, and I recognize now being almost in the same space you know um, in terms of how much time means when you're at a certain point in your life because to read anything for anybody is a sacrifice I means I'm not getting sleep or my son is not getting something or you know um, so I recognize how much they would have had to invest in me right um, at that point in time which was not in the chat room Anande asks uh, although hey, Anande. I have known <coughs> Paloma for over 30 years yes. I am fascinated by the stories of her earlier life and marvel at her resilience yeah. and Kali asked Paloma listening to you is quite enthralling and seductive do you keep a daily journal no. can you tell us about how that experience how how that experience shapes you thanks what experience in particular well I want to say about Anande because a lot of people don't know how this girl is my sister <laughs> um, and she has um, been a really not powerful source of inspiration for many other and, and support um, she's actually my son's godmother <laughs> one of his godmothers um, but the most active one actually <laughs> um, so Anande I'm glad you're in um, and you would know a lot about this spirituality and so on. Kali, I'm, I don't know, she's talking about my early experience. Uh. I don't keep a journal. I would tell my students that they should, um, but I don't keep a journal anymore because I just don't have the time to do it. But, um, yeah, could she clarify what early experience she's talking about? She'll uh, probably clarify later. Mm. What kind of theater excites you? All kinds of theater. I like new things and different things and things that are not run of the mill. I am actually working now with, uh, what's this about, what, 11 or 12 new playwrights um, at the National School in Guyana. And they are doing some very interesting things with work. Um, so I, I am influenced very much by the uh, school that comes out of Trinidad, which is a Brechtian theater. Uh, which is kind of minimalist and which is theater that basically just drops down everywhere anywhere and that's not require too much of uh, set and too much money um, but it's really invested in the actors and the story um, so yeah but I, I I could I could dig some op opera I absolutely absolutely um, we were actually working on an opera for the theater guild later this year um, but of course a guyanized one um, I could dig any kind of theater. I just like the arts. I, I think that anything that speaks to my heart and my spirit and my intellect in the way that good art, not all of it, does, I can, I can be open to that and I can live with that, yeah. yeah. Tell us about your book, Notes on the Media in Guyana, a collection yeah. of essays, and what was mm -hmm. the inspiration behind it? Well, again, the inspiration is really just to be able to collect uh, work that is studies the context of Guyana because you know my work is um, very interested in the way as I said earlier communications and of course media as part of that uh, really informs the development of Guyana uh, at one point I've been looking at the political development and media in the country and then social de development and these this is a really a collection of essays that I'd published in various places and journals and um, but most of them, except for two new pieces. And so I wanted to collect them because the students were saying they didn't have access, they couldn't get it, the this, the that. So uh, somebody approached me and said, why don't you uh, collect them all and put them in this book? And so that's what I did. Um, 
So it really looks at the, the, the history of media in Guyana as well as uh, certain political relationships that were inflected by the media and then uh, some of it looks at new media now as a kind of a big scratching the surface of what how new media is being dealt with in the country. Yeah. So. In this book, it, it is said you have a fascinating view of the evolution of the country mm -hmm. in yeah. tandem with the evolution of the media there. Yeah. What is the role of communications in a developing democracy? It, I think uh, it's everything. I really think it's everything. I, uh, I, th I see communication as the really the centrifugal force in any system. If you think of your own body, all right, um, you, if your brain does not communicate to this part, any part of your body, that they should do this and that, it's done, finished, right? The, body, the, the parts could be working independently, but there's going to be no movement, no coordination, and it's just not going to work out, right? That's a very basic. And so, but a lot of times when we are considering what happens in a country, right, at a big macro systems level, we, this is like, we think communications is okay. So it's just off on the side. I consider it to be a power, a type of power. And therefore, if it is so central to everything, to giving information, to, to getting information, to coordinating systems, coordinating actions, for people to be able to make choices that are informed and not stupid and not uh, based on any kind of manipulation, which is to me the critical thing um, for, for development is that you need to have an objective way of making decisions. It, it really ought not to be, um, and of course there are several schools that will disagree, right? But it really ought not to be that people make decisions based on who they like, who they know, who they want, uh, this and that. It really needs to be um, focused objective and communications is implicated in that in every way because you have to be able to get information freely, transparently from everybody and to be able to send that information out in a, as in an, as an unadulterated way as possible um, to, as, to everybody and then they can then mix and match that and make their decisions. And to me, um, when you have, um, when that, that process is interrupted in any kind of a way for any reason, you have dysfunction coming out. Um, and so that, in a kind of a nutshell, is what I think the importance. Uh, Guyana's own history, which I've been personally fascinated with, and I'll tell you where I start from, because I grew up um, traveling uh, and hearing people saying the most terrible things about Guyana and Guyanese, and I reject that 100%. Um, and I, even though I rejected this notion of the poor Guyanese, this, that, who need this and that, and who is so that bad that we got to be begging everybody and taking bad treatment from everybody else. That is totally not going to happen. For me, I'm, I'm not taking that at all, but we also have to be, to, I also wondered why it is that a country like ours that is so big and vast and has so much in terms of natural resources and have produced so many brilliant people in the world who have served the world and the Caribbean at such high levels um, and produced in Guyana, exported elsewhere. Why is it that we were not at the apex of development in the region? That was where I jumped off um, always. And I was always looking for a reason why, why, why? What, what is it about us? Small country, 700,000 people, and in terms of population, big, huge land mass, all of this, re all of these resources. Um, what is it that has has caused us not to reach what I consider to be our fullest potential? Why is it that everybody doesn't have a house, land, and a car in Guyana at the very basic minimum, right? Because we have the land for it, right? Um, why is it that there are still poor people and children in the street and so on and so forth? And so this has always been like my my real serious uh, concern. And so I've been looking at it as an academic because I'm not interested in getting involved in politics at all. Um, but I, 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 as an academic, I think that 
um, interrogating that question and being able to write upon it and make that information, at least the perspective that I have come upon, it's not the truth, because this, yeah, but whatever fact that I, my own thinking on it, to make it available um, to people is really what, I, what I've been writing what about. Have, what have some of the social scientists said in answer to that question? Have you asked any? Oh, well, no, I don't have to ask them. You read the literature here. Yeah, that's what you do as an academic. You read. And um, all kinds of things. You have systems theory, which um, harks back to that like, the world system is underdeveloping under these other systems, north, south, and this and that. And then you have those who talk about the uh, historical view of the plantation and the reproduction of uh, the new neocolonial uh, thing, which is still in the world system. Uh, you have. <coughs> people who talk about the personality of the people, right, still linked to, in a sense, um, where we came from and the fact that there's a schism uh, because of these different influences uh, that, you know, and that are being worked out over time. And then you have people who write about the political systems in the country. Um, you have people who speak about the culture, people who speak about um, corruption, uh, you know, in, you, you mean, it's like reading the paper. But just you, you know, in the context of theory, right? Um, so people say all kinds of things, right? Um, and all of them have, many of them have fairly plausible arguments from the perspective of their discipline as to why um, this is so. And one of the things that we always, uh, I took this away in high school, and I, I really wish that I remember the name of this teacher because I had a wonderful geography teacher who came to Queen's College when I was in my in North Sixth for a very short time. He was very shy from he came from Burby's High, I think. Very shy, very quintessential country boy teacher. But the one thing I remember always from his class was multiple causation. There's never really one reason for things, right? There may be an overriding reason or one one thing that is really the central thing or two things, but this thing uh, that there are many reasons why things happen um, is really a very, I think, a powerful understanding. So that is basically to say that all of these things that people are saying may be valid, but I'm not looking at those things. I just want to know what they said. I'm looking at the way in which the media communications in general um, add to that mix, right? And um, we have had periods in our history where the international media have vilified our country, um, have been used to un un unsettle uh, the country itself, the political systems that were developing for whatever reason. I've written about that, about the role of America and the role of Britain in the early period of our history. Um, I've written uh, about the present period um, and the way in which uh, monopolies and control, the tension between what is the public good and citizens' rights and the need to keep systems or people's feeling that they need to keep systems and status and control. Um, I've written about new media and the ways in which new media is undermining this control, is undermining this control, because in a certain sense you really can't control what people are saying on new media and how they communicate and so on, at least not yet. Um, so that's really um, what I'm, I've been doing as an academic. Um, Can you shed some light on the media as the fourth estate? Yeah, somebody was asking me about that the other day. Yeah, so. What's the first, second, and third estate? The fourth, second, and third, the, the, the <laughs> judiciary, right? Um, legislation, parliament. No, religion, school, judiciary. So media. So media basically um, is the fourth is usually referred to as the fourth estate because it 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 really um, structures. It's supposed if it works well, right? It structures um, what people think, how they think about it, and can set agenda for um, for action, thought. Um, it can uh, give information. Um, it can give misinformation. 
um, but it also so it's it's really considered to be one of those main socializing forces in in society because of these kinds of um, characteristics that it has. Uh, so really and truly, if you have a dysfunctional media, then you are uh, really looking at a society that's not going to develop. Well, this is one view, of course. There are several other views, I, I want to say, contesting views that will argue that, look at China, they're controlling and whatever, whatever. And so they're contesting views. My personal feeling is that uh, there has to be uh, transparency, openness, but respect and restraint. Uh, the media itself needs to be able to understand its own function and role um, in society as this socializing force, which is going to create m create the kind of citizen who is conscious in a particular kind of way to take conscious, organized action in a particular kind of way, right? Um, so that's. You mentioned that you mentioned the the, the communication process yeah. and when anything interrupts it, how yeah. it can create all kinds of yeah. chaos and dysfunctions and so on. Yeah. But who is ultimately responsible for the media? Everybody. Everybody. Yeah. So There's this thing called the triangle of trust, right? Um, which is really the media, the public that it serves, and the regulation regulators, right? And that all three of those are really supposed to be working together um, to and take responsibility. The media itself has to take responsibility because if they don't then what they do is invite regulators outside of their system, which is a particular battle I'm personally having now um, with you know, a particular agencies to, you know, that the media really should take, should be given the opportunity to take control of their own uh, regulating themselves rather than, you know, imposing that from the outside. Um, because if you don't do it, if you don't have guidelines uh, and this is like your own house right you don't look after yourself you don't behave yourself act responsibly you're doing nonsense you um, not taking cognizance of the damage you do somebody's gonna call the police or put you out of the house or something right so it's like it's just an, a bigger thing is that if you are not conscious and cognizant of the of your responsibility your role and do it in a way that is for the public good then you invite people who will act um, supposedly in the public good to regulate you and that may not necessarily be good because one of the things I always say is this when we are creating regulations for others we never think that in the next year or two or ten years or five years or next month we may be in a situation where those same regulations are going to be used on us and that is the really fundamental thing that people have to understand. So you regulate fairly so that whenever, whatever circumstance and whoever it's applied to, that regulation is fair and just in whatever circumstances, right? But me, I would want to avoid uh, giving anybody because then that's open to interpretation and all kinds of things, right? So the media really has to, uh, to, to, to stand up and, and, and take cognizance of itself and do the right thing and act in a mature way. Now, uh, because of the way the media in Guyana has kind of developed, evolved, you know, arrived for some, you know, depending on who and where it is, um, we have that work to do, which is education. And I always, I, I, my personal feeling is because I know everybody in the media because it's a small country and we teach and we, we, we have relationships with everybody. I, th I, I personally have seen where, where, where people know what, what to do when they understand what their role is and they understand um, how important, you know, their reporting is or their uh, coverage of something or, or whatever it is that they're doing. When they understand that, I, I see people taking steps to make big changes. The problem is that a lot of people in the me who own media in the country don't have that kind of training and background, right? And they, they did not come to the media with any such interest. They came to the, interest, the media for other interests. 
right? So now it is a job of educating them and working with them and constantly and consistently um, showing them how important they are. And I believe they respond. How would you describe the impact of the media on presidential elections in Guyana? Oh, I, I haven't, I haven't done um, a lot of work on that area. But I do believe, I don't have empirical, so this is like me just thinking it through, right? I don't have like data. But um, but I, I really think the media is important because how, how do you know what, what's going on, right? <laughs> so the problem is that you have, when, when you have elections in, this, in Guyana, you have, oh Lord, you have the media morphs into this, but of course, of course, it harks back to this point I was making just now as to why a lot of people uh, kind of went into media in the first place was to have a voice in a particular space and to be able to carve out, you know, whatever their interests were. But the media in Guyana suddenly becomes very polarized, much more polarized than normally. And so you can, it's very clear about who's back in whom and this and that. And in that kind of context, um, you can really get some it's, it's really about which one is more powerful and, 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 and uh, has a plethora, you know, a greater coverage of, of, and can reach more people. And to social media and the internet, which has now begun to kind of undermine that a lot so that it gives people who would not have a voice in formal media an opportunity to get their views out, to speak, and also to talk back and respond. Very important with new media, right? Because in the past, you really had these control channels. The editor, you had to go through editor for letters and this and that. But now, you know, people could write what they want on their Mariah Waves and this and that. And I think it's really wonderful. I personally think it's great. But of course, I'm not a politician. I am an academic, basically observing a natural system, right? Evolving and seeing how it works. And for me, it's a great um, field school. You know, I could just re look at this and see what happens. But... Um, but for others who have interests and so on, it may not be as exciting. <laughs> you, you, I know you've said you're an academic, you keep saying you're an academic and you're not interested in politics, but I want to ask you this question. No, I didn't say if that. You, I said I was not involved. You're not involved. I don't want okay. to be involved. I don't. If, you, if you were elected president of that. No, never happened. If you were. <laughs> never happened. <laughs> yes. What are some communication changes would you make? Uh, well, I certainly would pass Freedom of Information Act, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, I would reformat the Broadcasting Act, for definitely. I would certainly give um, radio license to the University of Guyana so they could teach properly. Um, I would ensure that there were some guidelines that were followed for everybody. Um, I would look at the radio license uh, criteria. Um, that they're, they're, that's in place now, and um, broadcast licensing criteria in general. Um, I would ensure that every public, every media, every government media and public agency had a communications policy that was based on freedom of information and uh, transparency and accountability, um, because I think that is really critically important. I would have a certainly a, a very clear communication strategy and platform and a minister of information coming out of my cabinet for sure, um, because that's a really important function to have. Yeah. So yeah. So maybe I don't know. Somebody else got free stuff there. I want to take yeah. a quick break. Yeah. But before I go, I want to leave you with this question: What is the relationship between the Theatre Guild of Guyana mm -hmm. and the Ministry of Culture, and how does that relationship benefit the guild? You want me to answer that now? Or? No, when we come back. Okay, all right, sure. <laughs> no, uh, you were asking about the Theatre Guild. Oh, the Theatre Guild, culture, yes, right? the Theatre Guild, sorry. The Theatre Guild. What is the relationship between the Theatre Guild of Guyana and the Ministry of culture, and how does that relationship benefit the guild? Right, um, it's a work in progress is the best way I can put it at this point in time. Um, 
the Ministry of Culture, I think, and the Theatre Guild are both learning to deal with each other because the Theatre Guild is really the only NGO, non-governmental free space in the country. Um, and I think we have uh, to understand and respect the fact that it is older than the Ministry of Culture itself. This guild was founded in the 1950s, right? Um, it's in its uh, 60th year or something, 60 something, almost 70 years this year. So the guild is constantly striving for autonomy and to chart its own course um, and to respond to uh, what is happening with very little limited resources in a very independent way and the ministries as ministries go uh, works to kind of control and bring everything on its kind of wing and so that kind of creates a lot of tension but the relationship uh, is good in uh, with some people for instance we have very excellent relations with the director of culture um, the theater guild has supported in fact, almost all of the teachers at the, the, the National Performance School right now that is run by the ministry is actually, are actually people from the Guild, including myself, Russell Lancaster, Ron Robinson, a whole set of people. A lot of our students, the students are from the Guild. So I think we have to learn um, to work with each other better. Um, but I don't think the Guild is about to um, give, up its, give up its autonomy for anything. And so that certainly brings me, in particular, into a certain kind of relationship with the certain people in the ministry, not everybody. Um, and it doesn't, it hasn't benefited, we haven't, the Guild has not benefited from the, from, from, from the Ministry of Culture um, in any big way. We have a, um, a, an old... A grant that we get a subvention every year of 700,000 Ghana dollars, which is about 3,000 US dollars a year. And we basically do run all our programs based on that and um, donations from other 11 companies um, in Guyana, which if we didn't have that money and members fees and our own productions and you know, we put our hands in our, and rentals and so on. So I think the um, there needs to be a better a much better articulation of the role of the guild and much more support coming but i think that that is on the way i don't uh, i would hope it is and we're working towards it royal johnson has asked me to ask you a question i'll paraphrase the best way i can yes. what, what are your thoughts on how the ministry accused of financial impropriety might have impacted last year's national drama festival and led to several talented young people opting out of this year's festival including last year's Guyana Prize for Drama winner, Mosa Telford. Okay, but I don't know anything about the National Drama Drama Festival, unfortunately. I didn't know Moses. Moses is a member of the Guild, very talented and valuable member. And last year her uh, her entry was from the Guild, but I didn't, I don't know that they didn't, uh, they didn't enter this year. The Guild has taken no decision that our, that we won't enter. So I don't know, I can't speak to that. In terms of financial impropriety, I, I don't, I see those are kinds of statements that I don't, I can't respond to that without evidence. Right. And what I can say though, is that we expected a certain amount of money, the prize winners expected a certain amount of money from the ministry, and that money was not given. But my own position on that was, where is the documentation from the ministry saying that this was what you were going to get? And nobody was able to bring any documentation that says this is the prize money. And I hope that this year that kind of that's not going to happen again. That if you're going to enter a competition, that there should be a clear contract, clear written terms of what the prize money is and what people will get. Because in the absence of that, um, you can't sue anybody, you can't do anything about it, and therefore you can't really seriously accuse anybody of anything because you don't have the, 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 the original offer, you know, in any way. So, uh, but I do know we were very disappointed um, in terms of what we got last year for, from, from the thing, but 
I was never present when the discussions about money were being made, so I can't honestly and responsibly accuse anybody of anything. W one last question by Royal. What is the status of Cine Guyana? Yeah. Cine Guyana is about to be incorporated and um, it's been kind of on hiatus for a little while again um, due to the lack of funds. Uh, so that is where we are right now, but the incorporation should be done. By the time I get back to Guyana, it should be done actually. And then we will go into the mode of advertising for members and uh, electing uh, a, a directory rate because the, the interim directorate, which I'm not on, by the way, um, is has been working. Um, my own job is has been just to, to donate the funds for them to be incorporated, which I have since done. So yeah, um, but I would expect to see them uh, begin to do work again very soon. What, what still surprises you about yourself as a lecturer and a, as an author? I think because I, I think I'm kind of very. I think I can be extremely. I don't take myself seriously. <laughs> I think that is the main thing. Is I I kind of like. I'm amazed sometimes my mother tells me my memory is short and that's why I'm going to always get into trouble and stuff. But I, I tend to let things go very easily and then sometimes I say, you know, you know you're going back again <laughs> kind of thing. So it's this question of this thing about, you know, just revisiting things and um, be, I just like, I like bright people and different ideas and talented and, and things that are, are, are really special really beautiful and good that's you know I, I just like anything that in that vein will fascinate me and I will be drawn to it as as well as anything that is uh, the opposite will repulse me and you will we will hardly ever find me associating with anything that I consider not to be um, unless it is for, for a reason that I think that is I can make a change from internally You've, which sometimes I have to do. Yeah. You've written over nine books. Yes. You're a playwright and a director. Mm -hmm. Does writing come naturally to you? No, I don't think writing comes naturally to anybody. We're not born with a pen in our hands. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it, it's not an easy process. But it is something that I have to do. Um, so I thinking comes naturally to me, I think. Um, I'm thinking in a particular kind of way, of a way. But writing is always a daunting task. I mean, you think about having to write 30, 40, 50,000 words and you're looking at a, a, a piece of paper that's blank and you know that this is a lonely process, right? I know. You're alone with your either typewriter, your pen, your computer, whatever. And you're going to do this by yourself. Um, locked in a room or some people write in all kinds of ways. But uh, it's a lonely process and it's not something that I... Um, if there was, a, if 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 I could dictate the thing to somebody and let them write it, I would do it. But um, but it's also empowering in many regards, um, and therapeutic in many regards, and cathartic in many regards, right? Um, if you're writing about things that you have to write about, so that's how I write now. Just because I don't have as much time as I used to, um, my life is filled with other people and looking after them and this and what they need and fixing this and fighting for somebody and all kinds of things but um, yeah so I, I, I write but I can because I know have a technique and I know how to do it you see how do you de-stress um, I go to the theater guild and work with my in the theater uh, that's to me that is a joy um, the managing the theater itself because of all the resource constraints that we have um, is, is a problem, uh, but but working in the theater in the arts is, is, is a joy. I go home, uh, play with my son, some video games. <laughs> um, you know, there I have a couple of very close dear friends who we I pray. You know, I I that's probably my biggest distress. I would pray, uh, and I will go sit in a church if I am really really worried or or thinking something true or looking for direction. Might go to the cathedral in Brickdown, which is my favorite. I have a corner there that I like to go to. Um, but really and truly, I, I where other people distress by withdrawing, I distress by doing things. I 
do something that is kind of different and meaningful and good and a positive result comes out or I'll sleep right <laughs> that always is good <laughs> Your book, Condoned by Our Silence, Issues Impacting on the Abuse of Children in Guyana. Yeah. What was the trigger that caused you to write a book on child abuse in Guyana? Yeah, well, that was, a, that was a commissioned work. I was working for UNICEF just before I left Guyana in 1998. And uh, one of the, it still is really a huge, huge social issue in the country, as it was then. Um, and I remember the 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 country coordinate representative at the time, Juan Carlos Espinola, and I having this discussion one evening late um, about a particular he won. I was rolling out a communications program, and I said, "But I don't have data." And I, how can I be rolling out a communications program for the for the for the for UNICEF? And I don't have data to guide this thing. So what I decided to then to do was to basically go through all of the studies that they had in, in, in the office and write for myself to inform my own work. And then when he read it, he said, oh, but we should really publish this as a working paper. Um, and it's still very much in play because somebody the other day asked me, it's 10 years old or something, somebody asked me to reprint it the other day. And I thought, yeah, but really we should be doing more work so that it kind of builds on this. This is old data, and a lot has changed in Guyana um, about these issues. Um, so yeah, that was the, how it came about. What did you discover <coughs> about yourself in writing this book? What? The, the Which book? book? Condoned by Our Silence? Yes. That I, <laughs> I think I was shocked at my own frailty as a human being I I couldn't uh, I'm always very 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 um, disturbed by anything that has to do with children if I pass I mean my friends will laugh at you and tell, tell you this all the time if I go to Nigel supermarket or the market 25 times and I see children selling in the market I have to stop and buy from them you know I don't need anything I just feel that children ought not to be in situations that make them vulnerable and I think it goes back to my own moment when I was nine eight or nine years old where so easily my own life could have been completely destroyed had I been placed in certain situations uh, there's another another moment in my own life when I recall that I think was a moment of, and this again is is at the stranger because I remember my mother trying to make ends meet one Easter made icicles and sent me on the seawall at about 12 or 13 with a ice bucket to sell but of course this by the time I walked out there the things were kind of soft and I remember this guy looking at me um, he, he was, it was 25 cents because I never forget this he took the I, he said he was going to buy this thing and he took it and it was too soft and he said I can't buy it very ordinary guy I can't buy it but a person like you should not be selling and this for me was a moment that, the moment that I knew that I was never going to do this this wasn't going to be I went home I got some good licks from my mother I think she used to beat at the one point <laughs> you know what I guess out of frustration and all that that's also something that I really don't like I, I have a horror myself um, and I just told her I'm not selling you could do whatever you want I, you're not sending me to sell up to now I hate to sell stuff I will raise funds right I like grants and so on for things but don't sell me to sell a ticket I will end up giving the ticket away and paying for it I, I, I ain't doing that um, and so for me these kinds of things I kind of I really began to feel like children in a country like Guyana why do we have children who are still selling still I was doing work at the time with the dropout drop-in center these boys who would sit, stay and live on the streets um, because the Sacred Hearts would have burned down eventually but they had a drop-in center they were doing work they would take them in and they would work and I was working 
before I left Guyana with those boys. Um, so it was the fact that I could not withstand seeing anything happen to a child. It was just completely emotionally disturbing to me. And it still is, even though I, I, I think I try very hard to... I think my way of dealing with a lot of it is to donate money to things privately, but not, not to go directly frontally into kind of counseling with children and working directly with children who are really, really um, in, in, in trouble. Because I don't think I will work with children in the theater, like therapeutic theater and so on. But, but really, children who are very, it's, it's, a, it's a problem. I have problems um, really um, doing that. But so my way of, I guess, trying to, inter to, to undermine what's happening is to do the work, do the research, and let people who are trained and have the kind of, I guess, emotional resi resilience to deal with that on a front line every single day. That's hard work. That's really, I think that's special work, you know. That's that's what they do. It's really special work. Yeah. That one encounter with that young man. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and I don't know who he is, like I said, but it, it was a defining moment. I've had a number of those where something from the outside really says, you know, this is not going to happen, right? Uh, I knew when he said that. And he said it with such, you know, he was apologizing, a right? But he was also saying, you not, don't do this. You, why, you know? And I, when I see little girls like selling, they would come up to you and they're going up to men and I'm thinking to myself, so many things could happen to these kids. You know, little girls, little boys, somebody could tell them, come by me for something. You know, all kinds of things could happen. But I also understand, having been there, right, how a parent um, or a grandmother, a lot of times it's grandmothers and so on, have to do this. They, 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 they're trying to find an honest means of taking care of these children and these children taking care of themselves, right? But I think that as a country, Guyana can do better. We have 700,000 people, man. And 200,000 children, 200 and something thousand children, what, 50,000 of them maybe in, in vulnerable situations, we can't, we can't do something to, to, to at least keep them from having to sell in the streets and all that, I don't know, maybe it's a good ethic, I, 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 I don't know, maybe I'm just coming from it, coming at it from a personal place, too personal a place, and yeah, but that's really where... I'm going to ask you a question. Time has crept up on yes. us. I'm going to ask you a question about Martin Carter, who you quoted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I'm going to ask you just some rapid-fire question, mm -hmm. um, which I really want to ask you. Mm -hmm. But you quoted one of Guyana's great writers, Martin Carter. Yes, the greatest. Look, The greatest. Yeah. Looking at your hands. Mm -hmm. I have learned from books, dear friends, of men, of men sleeping, sleeping and dreaming and hungering in a room without a light, who could not die since death, death was far too poor, poor. who did not sleep, sleep to dream but dreamed to change, change the world. world. And so if you see me looking at your hands, listening when you speak, marching in your ranks, know that I do not sleep to dream but dream to change the world. Was he one of your favorites? Oh, absolutely. And what does this particular absolutely. poem mean? I think this poem is really my own personal mantra. It, it speaks very specifically to what, why I am and what I do, right? Um, and I think it's not about money. It's not about personal fame. It's not about nothing. It's about doing what is important once you have the strength and the opportunity and the life and the breath to do it right so if you see me operating in a certain sphere do not assume it's because i am part of that sphere at all assume know that i'm there because i have purpose and it is a purpose for good at least the good that i think that i'm doing Right, so that's really, um, I think, very unlocks a lot about me that um, you may not understand, right? Because it's not about I'm not a joiner of things. I'm not a I'm not a person who would 
in I'm not in many organizations I'm in any you know, very many organizations but I will work with people when I think that there there is an opportunity to do something that is good and productive and if that doesn't work then I'm gone when are you most happy I'm happy a lot most of the time if you could go back in time what would yeah. you tell the 15 year old Paloma that is going to be okay it's what? going to be okay it's going to be what are you most proud of? My son? In retrospect, what do you know now that you wish you knew before you pursued your career? That it was going to be okay. That you, you, you happen, life is a process, and you get there, right? You get there if you do the right thing, and you do it diligently with all your heart, and for the best reasons, you get there. When is the last time you laughed? unusually hard <laughs> yesterday <laughs> yesterday but I'm, I like to laugh yeah. what is gratifying about being Paloma Muhammad? that I am Paloma and I'm okay with that no yeah what is one thing and I'm sure you've shared many but I'm gonna see I want you to be just specific mm -hmm. what is one thing about you most people do not know and you believe will surprise them that I'm shy I'm inherently shy yeah if you were given a second chance to choose a career, what would it be? Quantum physics, yes, we had already. Quantum physics. <laughs> Finish the sentence. Mm -hmm. I look forward to Sunday evenings too. Watch Lisa Punch on. <laughs> oh, yeah. Watch my girl Lisa. Yeah, yeah. What are you most thankful for? For my life and for the people who have touched my life, yeah. And for God in my life, yeah. For God. Can I ask you a favor? Yes. There's something you said that touched me very deeply just now. About if you see me mm -hmm. doing something or see me working in a globe, can you repeat that? Well, basically, what I was saying is if you see me working in a certain sphere or you know, uh, associating in a certain way, do not assume it's because I'm part of it, but assume, um, know that I'm there to affect whatever is going on in a positive way. So, yeah. Thank you so much. The last question which I ask all my guests, mm -hmm. what makes you laugh out loud? Anything funny. <laughs> Anything, I, I just like to laugh. <laughs> Anything funny. I, I'm very silly. I giggle all the time. And, yeah. I don't take myself too seriously. You can't. Dr. Mohammed, mm -hmm. my dear friend, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Mm, thank you very much. I, as I was telling you, I haven't done an interview in about 10 years, so this so is probably... Uh, I'm one so of the few so you can enjoy well, it too i am inviting you to come back as <laughs> soon as possible i i because i know your circumstances and how busy you are yes. i'm extremely extremely honored that you took the time to come here tonight yes. so thank you so much thank you thank you for the opportunity and thank you for doing this work huh? right. very important work you're doing yeah thank you good night all right good night